Guillaume, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having me, Todd. Yeah, pleasure is all mine. I'm really looking forward to this one. You guys have some really interesting stories to tell, so we're interested to, to dig in. Um, for the people that don't know you, maybe you could give like a, just a basic introduction to yourself and then kind of uh, your, your company, Lemlist, and uh, yeah, who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. So my name is Guillaume Moubesh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, Lemlist. Lemlist is a sales automation platform that allows B2B companies to automate their sales prospecting on multi-channels, so cold email, social selling, and also calls. In uh, the last three years, we grow from uh, zero to 10,000 plus customers with a vast majority of our customers based in the US uh, and all bootstrap, meaning with zero uh, dollar in funding. Yeah, so, well, congratulations on that. <laughs> One thing I just picked up on as well there, you changed your, your kind of elevator pitch or your value prop, you changed the sales automation. That's yeah. not, that was not previously the case. So maybe you can elaborate briefly on, on how that's changed. Yeah, definitely. So, so we started with uh, being like basically the most personalized tool regarding cold email. Because uh, prior to Lemlist, I actually had my lead generation agency. So I was helping a lot of companies in their sales prospecting. And when using all the tools on the market, I felt like there were not enough personalization. So you couldn't add like photos with dynamic like... Uh, text, tags, logos, or even like videos to make it like more compelling. And since sales is all about relationships, I was like, we need more personalization. So we yeah. started like this. And eventually, you know, I was doing also like uh, a lot of LinkedIn, a lot of calls, etc. And I was like, okay, let's get there eventually. And uh, as the product grew, we, we started like shifting a bit. So I think for us in, in terms of our strategy, but we might come back to that later. Uh, we we start with uh, we have a, a really like powerful warm up system, so something that allows you to get best deliverability, meaning that your emails end up in the inbox and not in the spam. So we have like really good warm up system. Then people upgrade to email outreach where they can send emails, and when they become like really they want to step up their game when it comes to outreach, they they start scaling up to the to the last plan, which is multi channel basically. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to hear about this uh, multi-channel. And it's interesting what you said about the personalization. I've only ever tried cold email. I think I, try, I tried it once and I did it roughly 18 months ago. And I used uh, Mailshake. And at the time, like our brand is quite human, quite personable. You know, we're kind of like no bullshit. We don't mind swearing and kind of being ourselves. <laughs> so that's kind of how I led in my cold email. I tried to use charm and uh, humor, but I wanted to personalize the email. So um we we wrote on the board i think i've seen it in some of your templates as well mm. you've, we've got like how we can potentially help and then you've got like bullets one two three to kind of grab people's attention but i was actually writing the name manually oh. on the board <laughs> and we were like taking pictures and then we had to like map it to mail shake with the it was like just really time consuming so i guess you should have come to Lemlist. <laughs> exactly exactly so you basically help people personalize at scale which you've learned basically gets much better response rates right being human yeah, and, yeah. absolutely gotcha Cool. So you have uh, two other co-founders, um, and it seems like from my research as well, you've, uh, by the way, really impressed. It seems like you've done everything kind of the right way. Um, it seems like you've built it from basically fulfilling a need, uh, you know, building a great product, getting people into the product as early as you can, getting feedback, building a community, building content. Uh, I also kind of noticed you're maybe uh, like a bit of the face of the brand as well. Um, but to me, it seems like you've just done everything the right way and you've just grown it organically, never taken funding. Is that, would that be a fair assessment? Yeah. And, uh, on top of it, I would say we never really like, uh, I know you're like a PPC expert, so <laughs> sorry if, uh, <laughs> if okay. I said we never, we never actually like paid any ads. So <laughs> Good for you. Good actually, for you. eventually that's a channel we might, uh, and we might get in touch, <laughs> but, uh, but for now, like it's, it's been mainly like us using Lemlist to do our sales prospecting and getting clients or just doing organic with uh, the growth of our community. So we built the biggest community around sales automation, uh, then also producing a lot of content, uh, showing, you know, like uh, how to use the tool at the same time as, you know, like solving a problem. So how can you make your, per your templates super personalized? And then, you know, we include the tools in the content so people understand like how to use it. And all these type of things has really generated like, uh, I would say like, uh, um, a very like nice circle of growth and uh, and flywheel of growth. Yeah, 
Good for you. Um, so I'm just going to go to my sheet and just look at some numbers just to give people some context. So this was actually from a, um, a pitch that you put on YouTube. You actually pitched to investors and you recorded it. You should definitely go check that out on YouTube. It is in French, the actual video, but you put uh, subtitles on there. So I took it from there. So in uh, 2020, last year, you and the end of Q1, you were at 1.2 million ARR. The end of Q2, you were 1.9 million. Q3, 2.9 million. And by the end of 2020, you were at 4.4 million ARR. So that's quite some impressive uh, growth <laughs> considering you don't do page, you've never taken funding. So I think that definitely uh, yeah, sets the stage. So let's, let's talk about this uh, really interesting um, project that you had with regards to funding. And this is the main thing I want to discuss with you. So you actually went about getting 20 million in funding. Maybe you can tell the whole story of why you did this thing and kind of how it's all turned out. Yeah, definitely. So actually, like I can give you the secret of uh, how everything started, or at least like where the, the idea came to my mind. So I was chatting with um, Nathan Latka um, yeah. and uh, it was during like a live and, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, he was saying like, you guys have a bootstrap company, you're growing like super fast, your numbers are sexy, like there's no need, you know, for you to raise funds. And then I told him, like, the, the only reason I would like to raise funds is to get an article in TechCrunch, <laughs> just, you know, like, for the fame. But I was saying, you know, like, kidding. And, uh, and then he told me, like, yeah, I mean, you know, you just have to pay a VC 5,000 bucks, uh, ask him to send a term sheet, and then you, you get in touch with a reporter and say, I have a term sheet from this VC. We'll probably say, no, do you want to write an article about it? And then it made me laugh. And then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, I mean, when you look at fundraising overall, it's very opaque. Like you, you don't have any information. You don't know how it goes. And since I started, you know, like documenting a lot on my uh, YouTube channel and I was posting like tons of tips and tricks on, you know, how to be more productive, how to network, how to do like all these things that an entrepreneur should know how to do. I was like, okay, uh, I've been interviewing like top founders about like fundraising, also like top VCs. And then I was like, okay, let's, let's challenge ourselves. And, uh, and challenge yourself to raise 20 million in, in two weeks. And uh, on top of it, I was like, we know that we're gonna say no. And uh, the reason we will say no is to show the world that you don't need to actually raise money to be a successful company. And you don't need to raise money to be in hyper growth. Because what I'm kind of like sick of in the media is just, you know, like all the same articles about who has like the biggest fundraising or like round of mm -hmm. fundings. And, and it's all about these numbers. But, you know, in the end, they never talk about the real statistic, which is nine out of 10 companies who raise funds actually fail. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, eventually I wanted to go and start a debate about that, start talking about profitability, employees' happiness and all these type of things, which for me matter like 10 times more than, uh, than, uh, than the rest of just like a, a round of funding. So we started this and uh, we recorded like an entire pitch. So it was quite stressful. Like it was lots of questions, lots you of You seem metrics. stressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was actually, you know, it's like, because, you know, like we, I had my, I had my end goal in mind. The end goal was receiving a term sheet so we can say no. And, you know, once when, when your pitch, obviously, like uh, it will, it will basically decide for you, you know, if you're going to get that term sheet or not. But once we received the $20 million like term sheets, because I was like, um, I was like really amazed because I announced on Twitter that I was raising like uh, $20 million in public. And then I posted on LinkedIn and then things got really crazy. Like tons of investors reach out. Like uh, I had like LinkedIn messages, Messenger, like Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, text message, some even cold call from VC. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then like uh, once we announced like this offer, it was crazy because people starting like, uh, you know, like... Uh, getting like to me straight away and i i we knew that we want we wouldn't take the offer so i didn't want you know like to to waste time from investors so i was sending them like kind replies very polite saying you know like i really value your time right now is not the perfect timing for us but i'll reach out whenever i think the time is right and see if it's yeah. a good fit and then they were like some of them were really aggressive like yeah but you know like uh how, how would you know it's a, it's, a, it's a good fit or not if we don't meet? Let's meet like next week. And then they were like giving me like Friday 10 a.m. or uh, at 2 p.m. Yeah. or anytime you yeah. want. Uh, I'm free at evening also. And I was like, oh my God, it's getting really crazy. And um, actually, this is when I discovered like a, a new type of fundings. So essentially like um, VCs, so like uh, venture capitals, 
the, their goal is uh, for you, like to, I mean, for them is to invest in the company. So the entire money they give is usually like almost 100% in the company. And if you start doing cash out, meaning like uh, taking money for yourself, it's usually a red flag for them. So in the US, for example, they would say like on the first round, if the founder is taking more than uh, $200,000, it would be a red flag for them because they want you to have uh, still like skin in the game, which, you know, like can make sense. But also, you know, it's uh, it's very like VC minded because it's like, yeah, we we're investing in pretty much like every company, but we want you to just be like super focused on yours. Well, actually, yeah. we're making tons of investments. So, you know, you can we can put that in perspective also. And uh, and eventually, like uh, the, the offer we got was actually from a private equity fund. For me, from my understanding before, like this uh, fundraising, like publicly, private equity was uh, really like uh, at a higher level. Like for me, it was, you know, like they, they start putting tickets at like a hundred or two hundred million dollars and not like that small. But they offered us like a uh, 30 million dollar. And what was crazy with that offer, it, it was 15 million dollar for the company and 15 million dollar for us. So it's just like those three co-founders in the company. So Vianney, Five Francois, million each. Yeah. Five million each. And and when you see that, you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I had my message, I had my mission, I had everything, but you're like, yeah, it's still five million in my pocket. Like, to be honest, like, I come from, like, uh, you know, like, my parents, they didn't do any, like, uh, they didn't study. They, they yeah, they, they grew up, like, in a farm. And, you know, it's five million. It's, like, life-changing. So, so the first time we received the offer, I was like, okay, first I didn't sleep. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fuck. And, and then yeah. I was, okay, we need to chat with uh, my co-founders, but also the team. And really, like, uh, what came up, and I think I was, after I slept on it, I was like, for me, my mission, I think, is more important because I, I help a lot of entrepreneurs and I'm really sick of having them coming to me, you know, and they, they haven't launched their product, they haven't talked to their customer, but they're like, hey, Guillaume, I spent like three weeks working on my business plan. Can you have a look at it? Or I've been reaching investors for months. Every time I send them this Excel spreadsheet with my business plan and how I want to grow, uh, they always have the same answer that I need to wait, etc. Like, can you help me out or can you like put me in touch with investors? And I'm like, fuck, like you're wasting such yeah. amount of time on fundraising when you should actually like go out there, meet your clients, uh, bring value, find like a real solution to a problem, like talk to them, like really like be, you know, in the trenches and and then I was like, okay, like it's. Uh, I think it's a good time for us to just like say no, explain everything, explain why we did it, and uh, and at the same time say, you know, like we're not against fundraising because for some companies it makes sense to to fundraise and and it can be, but we just didn't want and we were a bit sick also to have like uh, all these people, you know, telling that yeah, when you're bo- when you're bootstrap, it's uh, like kind kind of like a moms and pops uh, business, you know, it's like. Very yeah. small business. You know, yeah. with the big boys. Yeah, come join yeah. the big boys and have funding. It's like... Yeah, bullshit. exactly. Exactly. It's like, uh, yeah, you know, like, yeah, bootstrap, it's, yeah, it's uh, it's baby league, you know. It's like, yeah, you're not yeah. you're not yet. And, and for me, it's crazy because even in France, we have like all this um, like award and everything that are actually given based on the fundraising and not on your profits, not on your wow. like revenue, not on anything. It's, it's just like some criteria, like you need to raise at least X million dollars. And I'm like, yeah, what the fuck? It's yeah. Can I can I ask you a question about it? I mean, I'm I'd love to dig into that as well and some of the uh, the problems with funding and kind of like the the pros and cons of each. But when you approach this funding exercise, did you actually know from the outset that you were going to say no and you were going to use it as kind of a PR piece? Was was that the plan? Yeah, yeah, that was the goal. Like, cause cause yeah. for me it was um you know like it's simple. Like I I thought about it because I write a lot. I write a lot about our story. I write about like our mistakes, our failures, and also the things that we do right. But, you know, if I if I had written, like, uh, an article saying, like, why you shouldn't fundraise or why, like, fundraising is not equal to success, yeah, it would have been on our blog. People following me would have liked it. But it doesn't make an impact. Uh, it doesn't, like, change pretty much anything. And I was like, okay, if you want to get noticed, you need to do things differently. You need, you need to do things that you shouldn't do in the first place, like, according to everyone else. Yeah. And in the end, that's what entrepreneurs do, you know, like they do things differently. And, and for me, it was great to show that you can be different. You can inspire more people and we can start a debate. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, like you, you're kind of leading by example. It's like you said, you could write a blog about it, you can give your opinion, but you were just offered five million each plus fifteen million into the company for twenty percent. Was it? Uh, no, it 20%. was a bit. It was a bit more for the for the. They were taking thirty percent. The the. Team. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But then but you still. didn't accept the offer. <laughs> yeah. Still. Yeah. But like at the end. But at the end of the day, realistically, for you guys, I mean, um, you don't have to share the profitability. But I think you guys are. I, I heard you know in the hundreds of thousands of net profit, uh, you know, per month. So it's not like you necessarily need uh, the money to accelerate growth. Yeah, absolutely. So our gross margin now, I think in dollars, it's uh, it's above like two hundred thousand per month. Uh, yeah. So and and our goal is actually to give like a, a big chunk of the gross margin to our employees. So the idea is by the end of the year, every single person working at Lemlist will uh, end up with uh, on top of his salary with a bonus between like fifteen to twenty five k. So yeah. um, you know, it's really like for me, it's important. You know, it's entrepreneurship it's like it's an adventure building a startup is an adventure uh it's super important for me to give back and uh, i know this amount can be life-changing also because it allows you you know like to start an investment for a flat uh like buy a car like or do like you know like big things and uh and you know when you have like uh, vcs at your board like the things they would tell you is like yeah give um like um how do you so like it's not shares but similar like to shares like to your employees uh, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and basically that's it, you know, and, uh, and you can't have like dividends at the end of the year and they really want everything to be, uh, like invested in the business growth, which sometimes don't make sense because if you have like enough money to have like the peace of mind of, you know, I've got my flat, I can pay for the rent. I know that I've got like, uh, some savings and I can like sleep comfortably, etc. Then, you know, like the, all the decision you make are 10 times much more like impactful and it's yeah. not you know like laziness or whatever to you know like if, if you start being an entrepreneur for money stop you know like i mean yeah or like i don't know go to finance and do something else or but for me it's it's definitely not about that you know like i started to help people and i haven't changed you know like same uh, five dollar uniqlo t-shirt like i i don't <laughs> care about like fancy stuff so yeah can I, so on the, it was so Storm Ventures were the um, venture capital firm that you yep. posted on uh, YouTube. By the way, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the, the woman's name that you uh, spoke to. Yes, Pascal. Uh, yeah. she, she seemed great, by the way. She seemed yeah, she's uh, super nice. extremely incredible, very, very switched on. So, you know, kudos to her for letting you post it on YouTube. And uh, my, my question was around kind of how do you feel that could potentially kind of negatively impact that relationship because i mean you've you know you've kind of wasted her time uh, yeah and how, how is that conversation with her it's it's a really interesting question like i i have this question quite a lot and quite often so it's uh, it's funny but actually we're really like uh, in good terms uh pascal vision of entrepreneurship is uh is much more like we're super aligned so it's like helping yeah. more and more entrepreneurs like uh, to raise in good conditions to like do all these things and and you know, like uh, actually after we published the video, she had like tons of really, really amazing feedback from other VC friends, other people. They was like, yeah, it's uh, for them, it's like, it will become the same as the Airbnb pitch deck that everyone shared. It's like, you have all the questions that are gonna be asked, you know, when you have a SaaS company during a pitch and what the metrics you should know about, how investors work, what are the things they're looking for, etc. And and for her, it was it was actually like um, she really she was really like thanking me, you know, for the visibility and everything. And I also yeah. like uh, I also told her like a bit in advance, like okay, Pascal, like uh, our goal is not to raise fund. We we will say no, etc. Like she she convinced trying to convince us that we will send something. You will see, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I tell told her like we do everything publicly, so you know, because I didn't want to put her in a bad spot. And as, that's also why, you know, I, I didn't also like, uh, you know, mention the, the exact name of the private equity fund. Cause since I never met them, I didn't want to showcase their name, etc. With yeah. Pascal, I knew like uh, for her, you know, it's like she, I think she has a bit more the, the you know, like the, the American mindset. It's like you win some, you lose some. And in the end, you know, it's, it's never an issue, you know, as long as you're like transparent and, uh, and you've done the right thing, you know, it's okay. You it's know. a long game. Yeah, it's exactly. A long game. Exactly. And uh, and to be entirely honest, I actually like uh, once we received uh, the offer, uh, like with uh, 15 million in cash out, I actually, I think, spent uh, two hours on the phone with her <laughs> just, you know, to, to ask for her advice because I was like, 
like this is huge uh, in terms of money, etc. And uh, and and then she, you know, like she she was very like thoughtful, asking me about like my mission. Why was I, you know, into like uh, what was like? She told me like, okay, at the end of the year, you cross like the 10 million AR, and she she told me like, you don't need to hire like massive team to grow like no. at the same speed. You have very scalable business. She's like, okay, let me take off my investor's hat and tell you like, <laughs> okay, don't take it, keep growing, focus on your mission. You've been doing that for three years. It's uh, you're like killing it. So so go and and she was like super thankful and super super kind. Yeah, she she seemed great and. Um... Your presentation as well was super impressive. I mean, I listened to it in French, but I listened to the subtitles, <laughs> but it was, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll dig into this a little bit more in a second, but I felt like the way you, if it's not just an example of the types of questions that you need to uh, be prepared for, I would also say it's a very good example of how to answer them. Uh, because thank you. <laughs> uh, you were, yeah, no, but seriously, you, you were very um, clear and concise to the point you like answered her question like pretty much perfectly in my opinion every time you had all the numbers there in tableau i think like all already yeah, so, yeah. it was uh, stuck on the side yeah, it was already so <laughs> yeah it, it was super impressive from uh, from your side just going back to my notes as well um so one thing i heard you say on another podcast it was on the nathan latka show you mentioned and i think this was not so long ago rough i think it was in maybe q3 of last year uh, okay. and he was asking you about the uh, the, the if, if you'd sell the company and you said, no, you said, I wouldn't sell the company. And he asked you the question, what would you value the company? And you said at the time, I think you were 2 million ARR. And you said, well, if I'm being fair, it's like roughly five times. And I think you came up with a number of like eight, seven to 8 million, I yeah. think is what you said. And this is like <laughs> not long ago. And you now got a term sheet for like a hundred million uh, valuation. So how do you reconcile that? Like what, what happened? Yeah, I think actually it's a, it's a super point like uh, you're mentioning because I think like what's what's really important for companies to understand and also like how like valuation works because uh, on the on the side of Lemlist we also built uh, another tool like uh, Lempod that after 18 months we actually exited and the company got acquired so I yeah. really got into you know like uh, how SaaS how SaaS businesses are valued when they are actually acquired versus yeah. when they raise funds and the difference is basically huge because you know, once um, once essentially like a, a VC gives you a valuation of your company, evaluate the company in the future. So, for example, when uh, when you get like 30 million investment at, uh, I don't know, like a hundred million dollar valuation, it doesn't mean that your company is valued at a hundred million dollar. It's at a hundred million dollar. It means that essentially after you take the money and after you spend that money and grow, etc., we think that your company will be valued at potentially like 100 million or more. And that's yeah. that's basically the entire game with VC. Whereas when you try to sell your company and usually you sell it to either entrepreneurs or like uh, it can be private equity firm or sometimes like, uh, yeah, either like other companies, it's very like straightforward, much more financial. So it's like, uh, what type of assets do you have? Uh, they try to never try, they, they try to never value brands because for them, you know, it's difficult. So they, they like to stick to numbers. And then after that, you know, it's like uh, in the end, again, like the value of a company is the price that someone is willing to pay. But uh, still, you know, like I think you should always keep in mind that for SaaS, uh, depending on where you stand in ARR, but it's always like a multiple of the ARR and, uh, and yeah. Yeah, understood. Okay, well, maybe we can talk about some of those things you were mentioning in terms of what you see as the problems with funding. So speaking from my own personal experience, right, we work specifically with SaaS companies yeah. and many of those SaaS companies come to us because they want to scale up using uh, paid media. And you guys have had the luxury where you haven't had to do uh, paid media, which is actually quite a rare case. And in a lot of examples I've seen, basically they'll, I've, I've seen this multiple times. They'll say, okay, we're at series A, we want to get to series B. We're trying to get the next funding round. It's come, you know, you have to prepare six months in advance. And for this, we need to show growth. We need to hit these targets. We have the, the investors leaning on our shoulders to hit these targets so we can get to the next round. And they'll literally have come to us and said like, hey, we just need to like really throw some fuel on the fire. Don't worry so much about profitability. We're happy to even maybe lose money as long as we can show the growth. And it's like, it's this game, right, that people play. It's just about like getting to the next round, inflating numbers, using revenue. So, like, what are your thoughts on what's broken with funding in SaaS companies? 
Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think you you showed the first issue. You know, it's like people don't talk about like profitability and and the issue is like if you're not profitable, for example, on your ads, like how how are you like thinking that when you scale it will become profitable? You know, like it it don't really make sense because you have like mm-hmm. uh, lots of you know like barrier and uh, and audience saturation and so many more things. And on top of it, I think like um, the more money you have the more decision you can you ha- you you have to make you know it's like when you don't have money you need to focus on the channels that don't require to spend money and those channels are essentially you talking to customers that cost your time but it doesn't cost money you reaching out to people like it's very like uh, cheap or to do this on linkedin it's uh, it's basically also like only time and i feel like again like for me Raising money, it's, it's a huge defocus from the founders. You mentioned it and it's 100% true. You have to spend like four to six months and this is when things go quite fast, you know, like for, I'm talking like uh, maybe like seed or series A when uh, the company is not like uh, at um, with sexy numbers. When you have like really sexy numbers, it can be like much faster. And I think we were lucky, you know, with, uh, with that. But if you don't, it will take a lot of time. It's a lot of hassle and... And you lose, you know, like the the key objective or company, which is, you know, like really uh, providing value to your customers. I think like the the best money you can get and the best fundraising is actually like from your customers. So having customers paying monthly is the best fundraise you can do because you know that you're providing value. You know that you're like uh, on the right track. And and basically then everything can be like uh, about recommendation, word of mouth and, and growing like this. Growing organically doesn't mean growing slow. And I think like lots of people think that organic is slow, but that's not the case, you know. No. And no. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing is what you said, you said something before as well, and this is like kind of my two cents on it as well. When you don't have funding, you mentioned skin in the game. Like when you do things and it's all your money, it's you and two co-founders, you, like you said, you have to hustle super hard. Like you have skin in the game. So if you have, like you've made some money, you have to be extremely careful about where you reinvest that money. Whereas if you've got tons of money in the bank and it isn't even your money, I've never had that luxury, but I can imagine that you would just be a lot more kind of shoot from the hip, you know, like a little bit more in the wild west of making decisions where, yeah, if, if you don't have resources, you're basically forced to be, super resourceful and i think that's a strength yeah yeah absolutely and i think it's uh, i think it's the essence you know of entrepreneurship you start like started with very few things and then trying to make great things like all entrepreneurs like should do that and and should work on that i think like you know in some cases like fundings is necessary if you think about like uh, companies like clubhouse without funding they they wouldn't exist or if you think about like uh I don't know, like medtech or biotech, we need like huge investment in R&D from the start. They need that money. But yes. for example, for SaaS company, like we're in digital, like you can reach out to people, like you can, you can, I mean. It's, codeless, it's we're in a codeless uh, movement now <laughs> as well. You can build yeah. things with like, yeah. You can Come like, uh, yeah, you can build like landing pages for nothing, like get your first customers without having a product. Like it's doable it's doable and uh, and i see like too many people you know who, who just because they have a track record just say yeah you know i'm gonna raise like one million have a team and start doing things and from what i see from the outside is like the founders who have raised money when they start essentially they have to focus on the next round and they are focused on this they often lose the sight of what really matters for their customers they don't spend enough time with them and they have like, they rely on their team, which is great because, you know, you need to rely on your team. But I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's how you build like a, a sustainable business because for me, what was like really helpful is that for almost two years, I did everything. I did like support, marketing, sales. Yeah. So yeah. when I hire someone, they're not going to fuck with me. You know, like I know, <laughs> I know what you have to do. Like I yeah. know how to write like good articles. I know how to close deals. I know that when I do sales prospecting, I can reach out to X people and get X meeting. Like I know how things work. So if you know the ins and outs of your business, then you know it's like much smoother and, and then you can train your team, then you can help them grow and then you can really like share the yeah. vision and have people like uh, do the same. Yeah, I think uh, Jason Freed from uh, is it Twenty Two Signals at Basecamp. Mm-hmm. Um, he also talks about the same thing. Like, do the do the job yourself first, and then you can hire someone else to do it because you know exactly how. Um, yeah, super interesting. You um, 
what strikes me as well is, I mean, let, let's also be real. You, you're, your company and yourself, you're, you're an outlier. So I think it's in the sense of you've done things incredibly well and you've had a really, really great success. You, you're, you're definitely an outlier. So, and I think there's also a, um, entrepreneurship kind of gets put on a pedestal a little bit. I think, you know, these younger guys are kind of want to be uh, an entrepreneur. Like where did that come from f for you? You mentioned that your uh, parents, you said uh, had a farm. Like I just wondered where you picked up, you seem to have this uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial ability. Like where do you think that came from? Well, that, that's, that's actually a really, really good question. I don't know where it came from, but uh, I know that I had it in me like uh, I always loved, you know, like when I was really a kid to trade things and try to like bring more value in the things I was trading. So start with like uh, magic cards and then eventually get a Game Boy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, but for my parents, actually like business has never been like a job or like going to business school, like it didn't make sense for them. It's like, no, like uh, study science, you know, like for them, it was old school mindset, you know, they didn't go to uni or whatever. So it's like, if you study science, you'll get like uh, technical knowledge and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So I had to do like, I actually am a chemical engineer. I even no studied shit. like, uh, like um, advanced medicinal chemistry in Glasgow. So uh, I spent a bit of time in Scotland and <laughs> love uh, <it>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. drink a lot of beers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and, uh, and eventually like after that, I, uh, I, I had like my master's and everything. And I told my parents, okay, like I want to go to business school now that, you know, like I have my engineering background. Don't worry. Eventually, like if, uh, if there is no job, back on. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then they were like, okay. And, um, and once I started actually like, um, being in the, so business school are extremely expensive. Like, I think it's the same all over the world. So I went to HEC, HEC, which is like pretty, like it's the best business school in, in France. And, um, and when I was there, like, uh, because it was really expensive, I also wanted, you know, to, uh, to start like building a business on the side. So I started a business with my dad and, uh, for him at that time, you know, I became like the, I was the businessman, you know, cause I was in the best business school in France. So it was like, okay, like, uh, my son is going to help me like, uh, get a lot of money, build like a profitable company. Cause, uh, he is like, a, um, uh, designer, like a designer. Yeah. And, uh, and we started working together and I was like really, really naive when I started. So I was putting a lot of pressure on him. So we have like a lot of stock because I was like, once we, once we go live and start selling t-shirts, uh, the website, we need to be sure that, uh, it holds the loads because they're going to have like massive people trying to buy everything, etc. Uh, so I was building a community around Paris so we can use this community to like, uh, start, you know, like uh, selling t-shirts and everything. And uh, once we launched like the, <laughs> once we launched the, the website, we had like a zero order <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> holy fuck, you know? And then I felt like I felt so bad. And um, the more we were growing and uh, we started having a bit of sales, but very few, like five to 10, etc. And I was putting like, um, like a lot of pressure on my dad. Like I kind of ruined the, the relationship we had because we yeah. used to exchange a lot of ideas, but I was kind of, you know, like uh, making him pay for my mistakes. And yeah. uh, I felt really, really bad. And one guy from my school actually was starting his own company, which was a lead generation agency. And he was alone. And then he was telling me, I didn't know anything about B2B, but he told me like, uh, let's start this together. Like you're a grinder. Like I know a lot in B2B. Uh, let's exchange, let's grow together. And, and we started this together. And uh, since then, I really like uh, made a promise to myself, you know, to, to never really like let down the people uh, who I care about. And uh, and since then, I think it was kind of my drive to, to really like uh, work hard on customer acquisition, understand the ins and outs of marketing, sales, growth, growth hacking, and all these type of things. And, uh, and later on, we, we started building Lemlist. But, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I think it, it kind of started there. Yeah. Yeah. There a few things to unpack there, but maybe one question as well. Like I was asking kind of where your entrepreneurship came from and putting entrepreneurship on um, on a pedestal. So like all these kind of maybe younger guys that finished their masters, you know, like you, they wanted to come mm. out and start a business. So basically your message is you don't necessarily have to go and get funding. You know, there are options to build communities, to, you know, build MVPs, to, to fulfill a real need. But like that aside, would you agree that, 
Entrepreneurship also takes a certain type of person, right? Entrepreneurship is definitely not for everybody. It can be super lonely, you know, building a business. I mean, especially if you, you're doing it on your own. So what do you think of those like one, two, three uh, traits that you need to have to like going in, <laughs> like you need to know you should have before you start a business? I think, I think determination is uh, the number one. Like uh, you need Agreed. to be, yeah, it's like, if you don't have like um, you know like the the ambition and uh, the 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 grit and uh, and the, the grind that you're gonna put in the business, then you know like don't do it because as you said like uh, entrepreneurship in the end you know especially if you're like the CEO and you're like uh, you know handling like the most important decision you're gonna be lonely. When yeah. you win, you always win as a team. But when you lose, you lose on your own. And and even me, you know, I have like two co-founders, etc. But I know that during our lost, because we had like some lost and we did like some shit, you know, in the early days, like we made a okay, lot of, of mistakes <laughs> and I was alone, you know, it was, it was on me, you know, it's, it's on my shoulders. And, uh, so you need to be prepared for that. But yeah, I, I think like, um, I think, you know, like, um, Carol Dweck, uh, she, she was like a, a professor at Stanford and she talks about like fixed mindset and growth mindset. Mm -hmm. So fixed mindset, you know, are people who, uh, we think, for example, that you have brains that are good in mass and that are logical and you have other brains that are artistic or whatever. It's not true. Like we know that is, it is not true, but a lot of people have this mindset based mm -hmm. on, it can be based, you know, on your parents or your education or the, the society, which tends, you know, to force to say like, you have good student, bad student, etc. Uh, but actually like uh, when you learn about how the brain works, she also say that we have actually all the ability to become growth mindset, meaning that you understand that sometimes when you face a problem, the more you work on it, the more your brain will create new connection and the easier it will get. So for me, if you from the start have a growth mindset, it's much easier, you know, like to, to start a business. I think it was Einstein, you know, who was saying like, saying like, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not smarter than other people. I just spend like uh, a much longer amount of time on problems to solve them. And, and I think, you know, like this is the truth. Like if, if you can spend time, you know, on issues and uh, you just go for it, have the grind, then everything like uh, everything become like much easier. 100%. I always think like the, the best place to start is like, I'm, I'm probably wrong about everything. It's just like, how wrong am I? And <laughs> if you can kind of have that mindset going in, like, I'm going to be wrong. Yeah. I'm going to try, so I'm going to try, I'm going to try some shit. I'm going to get punched in the face and I'm just going to keep learning. And I, I totally agree. I think the number one thing, I mean, for me personally, is just, you have to be able to just, especially in the beginning, because you have like in the beginning, in the first year or the first six months, it's like you're in the honeymoon period, right? It's new, it's fresh. You're going to take over the world. And then like for most people, what happens is you get like a year in and you're like 20% of the way through your target and you're like, holy <laughs> shit, actually, this is going to be like a seven year thing, not like a, a two year thing. So mm. yeah, totally agree. Determination is, uh, is the way to go. You, you um, also touched there on, you know, burning, not, not know, like burning the relationship with uh, your father, but like what 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 was that like uh yeah like when kind of falling out with your dad and like you you've kind of taken those lessons on now and it seems like you want to have a bit more of a kinder type of a, approach to business like has that lesson really stuck with you and like how have you now carried that forward into what you do every day yeah definitely i think like um so i grew up like in uh in an environment where so i did like a lot of uh basketball in competition etc like in uh in one of the, I would say, like dodgiest uh, neighborhood in Paris. Uh, so I grew up, you know, with people like uh, motivating me, telling me that I was like a little shit, that uh, I was like, uh, stop doing like fucking shit, you little shit. Like, so with a lot of <laughs> insults, so nothing really like talking about your feelings and all this type of thing. So it was basically tough love, but I grew mm -hmm. up with this and I took my motivation from there, you know. And I guess like in the first business I did with my dad, it was super tough, you know, like to talk about the things that were stressful and I was putting a lot of things on him and eventually, you know, like uh, our relationship started like uh, being, you know, not as good as it used to be. And uh, and then we kind of stopped talking and eventually like right now we, we are like uh, good pals again. So that's nice. That's nice. But, that's uh, good <laughs> but in, um, in my business, like with, uh, with Vianney and Francois, who are like the, the devs. So we also have like very different mindsets, different backgrounds. And at first, you know, it was, we were clashing a lot. Uh, 
um, like they were they didn't want to say things I was more into like okay like what the fucking problem you know and like let's talk about it let's fucking solve this but they were not like this and I think what was super helpful was um, to start something called like a non-violent communication yeah so start talking about your emotion about how you feel when someone is doing something and so concrete super concrete example um, for them at some point they, st they stopped answering my messages because we were remote and they stopped answering my messaging and I thought it was like a year and a half after starting Lamlist I thought like okay we have no more company like I thought it yeah. was over because they were not answering they were pissed etc and I was like okay like what the fuck you know like uh, it's uh, and they were telling this me is a problem. Okay, yeah and, and they were telling me yeah like uh, you're putting too much pressure we stopped working etc and I was like oh my god and my co-founders are like two brothers Actually, they didn't stop working at that time, but they were like telling me this just to piss me off. So I was like, okay, okay. And one week later, when we actually started talking again, you know, it was it was really tough. And uh, and and we started talking about like really really deep things, which are linked to our feelings. Saying like, I was telling them, you know, like I'm the I'm the face of the business. I talk like every day to customers. So you know, when people keep asking me. When will this change? When will this evolve, etc.? And I, and I ask you this question, and I don't have answer. For me, I feel like basically you don't care about the business. And and then on their end, it was like, yeah, but you, when you ask us like ten times the same question, it feels like you're putting too much pressure on us. Dev is complicated sometimes. It's impossible almost to give like clear deadlines, etc. And then in the end, we just realize that it's not a matter of having clear deadlines. If you tell me between like three days to a week. At least I can say something. And for them, yeah. it's much less pressure because... And then I tell them, like, even if you think it's a week, I can send 10 days if that, le if, if that put less, less, less pressure. It's just yeah. a matter of communication, you know? And then we started, like, basically solving each problem step by step by talking about our feeling, about, like, you know, like, how people react and, and all these type of things. And this was really, really helpful. And, uh, and I also use it, actually, you know, like, uh, managing the team uh, when you need to give feedback. Because uh, sometimes, you know, like you're doing tons of things. You ask people like, uh, I don't know, like to write an article and you have like a clear deadline, etc. And they miss the deadline. So you're like, you know, like, yeah, you're missing the deadline, which means like you, you put me in a bad spot because etc. etc. And instead of just saying, why the fuck have you like missed the deadline? And like, you shouldn't be doing that. Like you want to get fired. Yeah, don't say this type of things and, uh, and rely a bit more on, uh, <laughs> on positive yeah. feedback and communication. Yeah. The nonviolent communication is an interesting one. I think I heard Tim Ferriss uh, talking about this and he had like a particular phrase for it. It was like when you, if you have conflict with someone, it's kind of like when you say this, it makes me feel like this. Exactly. So you're kind of, so yeah, you're kind of saying like, you're not, it's not like I, it's, you're kind of putting the blame on you. Like it makes me feel like this yeah. and then they can see it from your point of view. It sounds like you guys have navigated that quite well. Yeah. And, and I think it's really, really nice, as you said, because Whenever you're doing this with uh, this phrasing, you're actually like um, uh, basically like, uh, um, you know, like having the person feel the empathy, like people have empathy and uh, and they would understand like your feeling and not it will not be an attack or a direct attack to them. Yeah, for sure. Just to take a right turn for a second. Um, you got scammed by the Chinese mafia. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really want to know what the hell happened here. But there's a twist to this story as well. So do you want to tell the story? Yeah, definitely. Wow, Dame. <laughs> I was not <laughs> expecting that. <laughs> yeah, so so essentially, like, um, uh, between my uh, engineering degree and, uh, and business degree, I spent, like, a year traveling. And because I didn't have any money, like, I traveled the world for a year using only social network to stay at locals for free. Uh, so it was like uh, we used Facebook, Couchsurfing, Woofing, yep. Tinder sometimes. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> and uh, and and it was like a, it was really exciting experience. And once we arrived like uh, in China, I was with uh, my best friend. So we went to we were in Shanghai, and then at some point there are like three girls coming in and saying like, "Hey guys, like uh, can can you take photos of us and can we take photos together?" And Chinese, you know, when you're like European, they love to take photos of you. Like in the metro, everyone takes photos. So I was like, "Okay, you feel like a star. It's quite nice." You're like, "Okay, I'm Brad Pitt I or should whatever." Go. I should go, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Finally, a country where they recognize me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants to take a picture of me. Of course. <laughs> and then you know, like um, we took pictures, and and then they were like, "Hey, like uh, we're gonna go to that like show, which is like a kung fu tea." 
And then I'm like, my friend loves Kung Fu and martial arts. He's been doing martial arts since he was five. So he's like, hell yeah, let's go. Let's fucking go, you know? And, and they, they start walking and we do like kind of a lot of circles and run. And finally we arrive to that tiny place. And I'm like, okay, this looks a bit weird. We enter the room and then we enter like another room and it's very small and tiny. And my friend is like, how the hell are they going to make like Kung Fu, you know, in such a little room? And, and then we start asking, you know, like uh, the girls, like, how are they going to make Kung Fu, you know? And they're like, no, no, it's not Kung Fu, it's Chang Fu. And you're like, oh, fuck, you know, like uh, a, a Chinese word you don't understand. And you're like, okay, I mean, you know, you're not fluent in Chinese, it makes sense. And then we start seeing the menu and the price are reasonable, but maybe like, uh, so the price on the menu is basically like price per teapot. And we're like, I think in total, we're like five or six. And we're like, okay, fine. It's, uh, it looks like expensive tea, but let's, let's do a degustation. It's like five different teapots. And in total, it would be maybe like uh, five to 10 uh, euros per person. So we have everything and then it gets like super warm. And I don't know, I have a weird feeling like, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like there's something, you know, getting there. And, uh, and eventually, like uh, when they bring back the menu to add like more expensive stuff, we see the price and the price have totally changed. It's not no. like price per teapot. First, they have doubled the price. And then it's like price per person per teapot. So the money has changed. They double everything. And then the girls who are there are telling us, no, no, it was the right price. Like we had the same menu from the start. So you're like, shit, did I, did I misread did it? Did I you you know, get like, this wrong? Or yeah, like, yeah, you know, what? like I was, and, and you blame yourself. And you're like, fuck, you know, and, and we didn't have money, et cetera. So we're like, okay, it's uh, in total, it was almost a hundred bucks. And I'm like, fuck, a hundred bucks to drink fucking tea. That's like uh, a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, holy shit. And uh, and my friend didn't have money because he didn't bread uh, like a lot. So I was like, okay, like, let's see. And in the end, we spent like, I think 80 bucks. And I'm like, okay, like, uh, let's uh, let's walk let's walk away from there. And then the girls are like, yeah, like, uh, we're going to go to another place. Like, let's meet later, whatever. And, and then, you know, like uh, my friend opens like uh, a tourist guidebook and then he sees like three Chinese girls come to see you and ask to take a photo. Then they ask you to walk you like uh, to a Kung Fu tea. Don't go there. It's a scam. And then I was like, oh. are you fucking serious? <laughs> and then I was like, oh my God. So then they explain, you know, in the guide that they usually go in round just so you're like totally lost and you can't find the place. So we went back to the main square where we met them and they were still there. So we went and confront them, asking them like, what the fuck? Like you stole our money, etc. And then they were like, we don't speak English. We don't understand, etc. Pretending that they don't know us. Yeah. So we came back home. We, we were actually like our host. Uh, we were late to a meeting with him, like because we're, anyway. And, uh, and then during the night, I couldn't sleep. You know, when we talk about determination, yeah. This is like in my, like, I fucking hate being scam. I fucking, I was like, I'm going to take the revenge. So I woke up at 2 a.m. I was going on internet, like, what can we find, etc. The day after that, we go back, we find the place. Once we saw, we saw the three girls in the same place. So we decided to went to see the police. Um, one guy, like, uh, decided to come with us. And from what I read, it was basically possible when the police was there to get your money back or at least a bit of your money. So when we entered, because I knew the guy was going to basically like uh, trying to negotiate and everything, uh, basically I, I all, I used everything that, you know, Chinese people are afraid of, which is like uh, losing the face, uh, talking about their country, etc. So I was like, you know, I came to China with uh, like uh, the, the impression that it was a country with respectful people and people yeah. that were kind, etc. And here I'm getting scammed on my fifth day. Do you think it's normal? It's not about the money it's about respect etc etc yeah so the, the nice. cop was like fucking mad etc and then in the end the guy was like okay like can they share uh you know like the um, how do you call it? like the the coupon like the fire the the invoice you know with uh, with yeah. everything and i'm like we got scammed do you really think that we had an invoice <laughs> actually we had one but i didn't want to show it uh so so the guy was like okay how much was it in total and then i said yeah we paid like 200 bucks and then he's like Okay, so if I give you like uh, 160, would that be okay? And then I no. was like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's not even about the money. So we took 160 and then my friends was like, did we just make 80 bucks? And I was like, yes, we did. <laughs> and then we went to a restaurant, had a massive like feast. <laughs> I love so it. it. Was, yeah, it was, it was a good time. And it's a good, it's a good way, you know, to start a trip that's going to last for a year. 
don't be scammed or know that at least if you get scammed, you know, they're not going to fuck with you for a long time. <laughs> and there's like a perfect example of like the inherent determination in you that you woke up at two in the morning. You're like, right, the Chinese mafia has scammed me. I need to get my money back. Good for you, man. Love it. Uh, thanks. How about um, just going back to, uh, to Lemless just to kind of close up. Um, like what are the, um, so we spoke at the very beginning about, you know, moving more towards like sales automation and also, um, the multi, uh, channel. Yeah. Uh, do you maybe want to speak about like, what are the future plans for, for Lemlist? Yeah, definitely. So our mission, you know, in the years to come is to help like uh, 1 million entrepreneurs launch profitable business. And from my experience in these three years, you know, like in the space is that sales prospecting always work. But what doesn't work is when people have the wrong expectations or at least when they think that you can automate everything, it's going to be autopilot and you can be just like chilling and getting links on autopilot. You need really like to, um, to spend a bit of time and learn how to do it. So since I always love like to teach new things and I try to be like uh, very clear in the way I explain things, I've decided to launch like uh, I launched a course last year in France and it's working really, really well. And sometimes, you know, like I, I do like um, one hour into like schools, digital marketing school, a bit worldwide, et cetera, to explain. And I realized like when you teach to people and when they see the benefits, then, you know, everything's become like much smoother. So we've decided to launch a few like courses in the coming months. We also yeah. want to launch like uh, a bit more things like because one of the key, you know, to our growth was really about like uh, all the things that we've learned whether the tool we used or the guides we read or pretty much like uh, all the inspirational stories. So my team, like I put like a few persons from my team based on all the stuff that I've put in some place, like in Notion, like during the years. And I've asked them like to really do for like six months, uh, going into all the communities, doing curations of the best tools, of the best guides that you can filter based, you know, on the AARRR funnel. Yeah, uh, so acquisition, funnel. activity, well, yeah, pirate funnel. Yeah, that's easier that way. <laughs> and uh, and basically, we're going to launch like free side marketing project where people, I think, probably will leave us their email to get access to like this type of resources when they can really learn, get uh, one place, you know, when they have all the resources that gets updated like uh, on, a, on a regular basis, etc. So we have like a lot of new challenges and, uh, and we really want to grow the community, help more people like... Uh, be successful in their business and uh, and yeah, build the, the right content for it. Yeah, you guys have done uh, incredibly well. I mean, is there any um, closing uh, thoughts you want to pass on to any young entrepreneurs that are thinking about starting their own SaaS company, maybe are debating whether they should have funding or not? Yeah, is there any advice or closing words for those people? I think like, so first, if you're debating whether or not you, you should raise funds, I think like... Uh, Good question to uh, good things to understand is that getting someone in your company is like a marriage. So having a VC is like having a new co-founders. You need to know about this. And if you decide to raise funds, which in some case can like really work well, make sure that you really do your due diligence on the investors. So ask them to make an intro to a CEO of their portfolio where things are going extremely well. And ask them also to make you an intro to a company or a CEO in their portfolio where things are going like terribly bad. Like for example, the company failed, uh, the company shut down or all these type of things, but get in touch with the people when it didn't work. So you understand the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. Once you have the full picture, it's much easier to decide. And if you're just like a, a young entrepreneur uh, and you're wondering or like aspiring entrepreneur, you're wondering what to do or what not to do. I think like uh, just go to Nike and read their tagline, which is just do it. I think like, to be honest, it's difficult to do something like better than them. I'm not just sure. Just fucking do it. <laughs> just fucking do it, yeah. yeah no, yeah. seriously, because in the end, it's all about execution. It's about grind. It's about like you showing up every day, taking that call, sending that email, uh, writing that article, writing that post, and trying to be consistent about it. Because in the long term, consistency beats everything. 100%. Just to add on that as well, what you said about Nike, just do it. Have you read uh, Shoe Dog? Oh, I've, I, it's on my to read list. I've started and oh. then like I went to another book and I need to, I need to. It's so, so good. And I would also add to that. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, like, again, just to echo the sentiment of our whole conversation, if anyone's thinking about starting a business and read that book, because that, that book is like, 
it just shows you the years, the decades of just pure grind that guy, <laughs> you know, put in or that the team put in at Nike. So uh, definitely a book I would recommend. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I, um, yeah, it's been really nice meeting you and thank you so much for sharing your insights on funding. Really intrigued to see how it's going to go uh, taking, uh, yeah, your own kind of trajectory. Uh, s- super cool. And where can people get in touch with you? Uh, kind of where are you most active? Uh, I think LinkedIn is a is a good place. So you can either type like G dots or uh, CEO of Lemlist and you will find me uh, or uh, Guillaume at Lemlist.com. But I guess my French uh, French first name is impossible to <laughs> to spell. <laughs> so LinkedIn is the uh, easiest way to get in touch. Good, man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and uh, speak soon. Thanks a lot for having me, Todd. Take care.